Hey guys, it's Jane. Here am I out in my backyard again because it's a beautiful day. Well, it's sunny at any rate. And uh, every time I try and film in inside at the moment, it's noisy and or dark because it's night. So we're going to have a keep a try in here. I am here today to do another uh, taste. And today we're going to have a taste of Jasper Ford's unfortunately titled, as it turns out, Shades of Grey. Not any particular number of shades, just all the shades, all the shades of grey. Um, let me read you a little bit from the blurb. It's Britain, but not as we know it. Entire cities lie buried beneath moorland. Echoes of lost technology pepper the landscape and there is evidence of conflict in abundance. Democracy has been replaced by a colotocracy. Visual colour dominates society from the feed pipes that keep the municipal park green to the healing hues you view to cure illness too. A social hierarchy based upon one's limited colour vision. You are what you can see. Eddie Russett has no ambition to be anything other than a loyal drone of the collective. With his better than average red perception, he could marry an oxblood, inherit the Stringworks, maybe even make prefect. Life looks colourful. Life looks good. But then he moves to East Carmen and falls in love with a grey named Jane who opens his eyes to the painful truth behind his seemingly perfect society. Where have all the spoons gone? What happened to all the people who never returned from High Saffron? And why, when you begin to question the world around you, do black and white certainties reduce themselves to shades of grey? Okay, let's get into it. The guard's van was stacked high with boxes of fresh fruit, crates of chickens and personal luggage that couldn't go in the boxcars. The train was too small to waste a grey on manning a buffet, so there was a small service of kitchenette. I wasn't the only one in the guard's van. Sitting on a pile of leather suitcases was a shabby looking man in early middle age who was attired with great incongruity in standard social number four, a casual sports jacket with striped shirt and loosely knotted plain tie quite unsuitable for travel. He had a faded yellow spot on his grubby lapel and his hair was not only without a neat parting but without any sort of parting. I should have disliked him upon first noting his hue but there's always something ineffably sad about a fallen yellow, perhaps because yellows hate them more than they even hated us. I lit the spirit stove and set the copper kettle to boil. Where are you headed? I asked. Emerald City he said in a softly spoken voice, on the night train. He meant reboot. The arrival at Reform College during first light was meant to signify a new dawn and a fresh beginning. You're on the wrong train for that, I observed. Green Sector North is on the other side of the collective. The farther the better. I was expected there a week ago. You don't have any grub on you, do you? I gave him a slice of seed cake from the kitchen and popped a 10 cent piece in the jar. He consumed the cake hungrily and then told me his name was Travis Canary from Cobalt City. Eddie Russett, I said, from Jade Under Lime, Green Sector South. Friend? It was unusual to be offered a friendship from a yellow and ordinarily I would have refused, but I quite liked him. Friend. We shook hands. So where are you going? He asked. East Carmen. Their swatchman retired unexpectedly and Dad is to fill in for a couple of weeks until they find someone permanent. I wanted to be a swatchman, said Travis thoughtfully, playing with the label on a consignment of cocoa beans. Healing people, you know. But I'm a third generation sorting office manager, so I didn't have much choice. Why are you with your father? Apprentice? No, I replied. <sighs> I made Birdie Magenta do the elephant trick at lunch. Two jets of milk shot out of his nostrils and went all over Miss Bluebird. I successfully pleaded prank status, but the head prefect thought a bit of humility realignment in the outer fringes might be good for me. Birdie's his son, you see. Did they set you a pointless task? I'm conducting a chair census. Oh, it might have been worse, he said with a grin. This was true. I could have been checking the collective stool firmness for head office's dietary research facility or something. Mind you, that was a worst case scenario. I found some tea and placed a measure into the house shaped infuser and then I searched in vain for some lemon. Travis looked around for a moment and then reached into his pocket and pulled out a silver swatch case. He snapped open the compact, gazing deeply at the colour hidden inside and then said, Lime? 
I considered for a moment that he might be trying to trick me into an infraction so he could steam me for some merits, but he looked so lost and beaten and hungry that I decided he was genuine. Besides, I hadn't green peaked in months. Dad was quite strict because he thought lime could lead on to harder colours, but he was also realistic. As soon as you've taken your Ishihara, he'd told me, you can look at whatever you Beijing well please. Go on then. Travis turned the compact towards me and as my eyes fell upon the calming shade, I felt my muscles relax and my anxieties about travelling to East Carmen fade away. Everything about the world seemed rather jolly suddenly, even the crummy bits, of which there were many. Constance's inconstancy for one, and the fact that I wouldn't see the quirky rude girl with the Rutro snows again. But I was unused to peeking and my head was suddenly full of Handel's Messiah. Steady, tiger, he said, and snapped the compact shut. Sorry, I replied, my ears momentarily deafened by the music. He laughed and asked me if it was Schubert. Handel. So, listen, I said as my inhibitions became lowered by the line. What did you do to get sent off to reboot? He thought for a moment before answering. Do you know why residents are discouraged from relocating within the collective? I knew that travel was limited, but I'd never thought to question the reason. To stop the spread of mildew and disrespectful jokes about purples, I should imagine. It's to save the postal service from descending into chaos. That's a nonsensical suggestion, I retorted. Is it? Centuries of unregulated relocation have exacted a terrible burden. A letter might have to be redirected any number of times, as its mail route would have to follow not only your own, but all your ancestors' meanderings around the collective. This was true. The Russets had moved only twice since we were downgraded, so we, we could receive mail in two days. By contrast, the ancient and well-travelled Oxbloods with their prestigious SW3 postcode were on an 87-point redirection service and would be lucky to receive mail in nine weeks, if at all. A bit nutty, I consider, but it works, doesn't it? On the contrary, if you or an ancestor of yours have lived in the same place more than once, the mail redirection service defaults to the earlier redirection and goes around again. Three quarters of the entire postal service does nothing but move posts that is stuck in perpetual redirection loops and it's never delivered at all. But here's the really stupid bit. The post office's operating parameters are enshrined in the rules and cannot be changed. So head office reduced personal travel in order to impose a lesser burden on the postal service. That's insane, I said, my tongue still loosened by the line. That's the rules, said the yellow. And the rules are infallible, remember? This was true too. The word of Munsell was the rules, and the rules were the word of Munsell. They regulated everything we did and had brought peace to the collective for nearly four centuries. They were sometimes very odd indeed. The banning of the number that lay between 72 and 74 was a case in point. No one had ever fully explained why it was forbidden to count sheep, make any new spoons or use acronyms, but they were the rules, and presumably for some very good reason, although what that might be was not entirely obvious. So where do you come into this, I said. Well, I used to work in the main sorting office in Cobalt. I attempted to circumvent the rules with a loophole to stop redirections for long deceased recipients, and when that failed, I wrote to head office to complain and I got one of their your request is being considered form letters and then another. And then after the sixth I gave up and I set fire to three tons of undeliverable mail outside the post office. That must have been quite a blaze. We cooked spuds in the embers. I suggested a better way to queue once, I said in a lame attempt to show Travis that he wasn't the only one with radical tendencies. A single line, you know, feeding multiple servers at lunch. How did that go down? Yeah, not very well at all, really. I was fined 30 merits for insulting the simple purity of the queue line. You should have registered it as a standard variable. Does that work? Trap said that it did. The standard variable procedure was in place to allow very minor changes to the rules. 
The most obvious example was the children under 10 are to be given a glass of milk and a smack at 11am rule, which for almost 200 years was interpreted as the literal word of Munsell and children were given the glass of milk and then clipped around the ear. It took a very brave prefect to point out, tactfully of course, that this was doubtless a spelling mistake and should have read snack. It was blamed on a scribe's error rather than rule fallibility and the variable was adopted. Most loopholes and leapback circumvention were based on standard variables. Another good example would be the train we were riding on now. Although the railways had been banned during leapback 3, a wily travel officer had postulated that a singular railway was still allowable. Hence the gyro-stabilised inverted monorail in current usage. It was loopholery at its best. It's not generally known, but anyone can apply for a standard variable, explained Travis, and all the council can do is say no. Which they will, sure, but at least you're covered. I finished making the tea and then looked for some biscuits without success. Hey, said Travis, as he had had an idea. What's this East Carmen like? I don't know. It's out of fringes, so pretty wild, I should imagine. Sounds perfect. Who knows? A fellow yellow may take pity on me and negotiate a pardon. Hey, do you have five merits on you? Yes, thanks. I'll buy them off you for ten. What's the point in that? You're going to have to trust me. Intrigued, I handed over a five merit note. Thanks. Now, uh, snitch on me to the duty yellow when we arrive at East Carmen. I agreed to this and then thought for a moment. Can I have another peek of your lime? Okay. So I did. And I felt all peculiar again and told Travis rather gushingly that I was going to marry an oxblood. And that's a taste of Shades of Grey by Jasper Ford. And if you like what you heard, you might want to check it out. I'll talk to you later. Bye.